All right, welcome to the July 7th Hunter-Ledger Technical Steering Committee call. As you are all aware, uh, two things that we must abide by on the call. The first is the antitrust policy notice that is currently being displayed on the screen. And the second is our code of conduct, uh, which is linked in the agenda. Uh, as far as announcements, we have the standard announcement uh, that we have every week. The Dev Weekly Developer Newsletter goes out each Friday. And if there is something that you would like to reach the hundreds of developers that we have, uh, please consider leaving a comment there in the wiki page that's linked also in the agenda. Um, any other announcements that anybody might have? No, okay. Uh, so as far as quarterly reports, uh, we don't have any due today. Um, it looks like we took a, um, a little hiatus here on the quarterly reports, but I did include a link in the agenda for checking any uh, open tasks that you might have um, to see if there's any open quarterly reports that you haven't yet reviewed. Uh, I did see a number of people doing that as I came in this morning and saw a bunch of emails from the wiki. Uh, so thank you to those who did take the time. If you haven't yet had the opportunity, um, please do so. Uh, catch up now is a good time to do that without any quarterly reports coming in. Um, although I did see that uh, the Hyperledger Fabric report came out. Um, it is due next week, so it's actually a week early. Um, but thanks uh, to Dave for um, doing that, and I think Arno for updating the wiki the agenda here to include that link um any any comments or questions anything that anybody wants to bring up before we get to the discussion item that we have for today okay seeing none uh then we do have a one discussion item for today it's a carryover from last week. It is the security task force recommendations uh, that Arun wanted to bring to the technical steering committee. So Arun, I'm going to hand that off to you um, for walking us through kind of those recommendations. Thanks, Tracy. Um, last week, we were unable to cover this as I was running late and then we could not get enough time at the, after discussing previous week's agenda items. Um, so this is the second time we are bringing the recommendation sheet that I'm showing currently to the TSC. In the previous call, I briefly discussed these 10 different action items or 10 different gaps that were identified and that we had to work on. However, um, one of them is already um, considered and accepted from the TSC where we are mandating that each project should have a representation and, and, and have a representative who will be responsible or who will be first point of contact for anything related to security and including fixes that are to be done including issues that are reported and continuing on that discussion and i noted that there were few open items from from the time that we last met last assembled on this topic few of the other topics that um, that are straightforward or recommendations from the task force is to adopt some of these um recommendations that are coming in from open ssfs right away so I'll, I'll defer to some of the comments added over here even within those uh, bullet items for the discussion uh, point however i'll just cover different items that are to be adopted or, and as a recommendation that are coming in from open ssf one of them is the scorecard and i know um we had different badging proposal last year and then we went through multiple iterations in, in discussing that so scorecard is kind of going to uh, score each project each repository and uh, through it, it takes us through a checklist and then make sure we are um, compliant and we are following some um, suggested recommendations which are good to follow from a security standpoint and there was a recommendation that there is no reason why we should not follow and that becomes one of the metric for for us on how we utilize it however the uh, um, bigger picture or bigger point over there is um, it, it was related to how well each project is um, 
responding or reacting to the issues and in this kind of ties back to this point number seven that is written over here in terms of uh, responsible vulnerability disclosures one of the open item or a bigger debating item that also came up in this week's task force meeting is also on how do we make sure each project um, is is advancing on the issues that were reported right so um, this is where we need discussion within the TSC and probably potential ideas on how that can be implemented across projects or uh, like I can just talk through some of the ideas that we had from the task force so one thing would be that um, CEVs are to be addressed from the time they are reported within 90 days of time if they are not addressed within that um, amount of time then it will be made public and um, it kind of becomes um, and, and, and kind of adds a pressure to the maintainers that they will have to complete uh, they are allowed to address this within 90 days and this they want everyone to know that something like this exists in the project which i don't think that should be done i mean it kind of forces everyone to do it so um this was one of the idea right so um again this has to be uh, uh, there was a recommendation there should be strict guidelines around how um, I mean, the responsible disclosure element itself. So there are two angles to it, uh, the, the responsibility from within the project and then the responsible disclosure aspect of it. Um, so I'll, I'll probably pass a while. And um, of course, there are a few other elements. I mean, we, we would like to definitely, uh, I want everyone's um, opinion or probably debate on this item. And the other non-conflicting or straightforward items are with respect to uh, the, the uh, release process, which was open in the previous discussion. So there were discussions around this in not this week's call, but the previous week's call. Thanks to um, Artem for all the inputs. I think you suggest, also suggested um, that Fabric team uses Trivi um, for all the production I'm not sure if it was Fabric or at your workplace, but you are using Trivi for scanning container images. So idea was to have a, a pipe, uh, the, the verification or the reporting process or the identification process built in to the pipeline and um, in the CI and in both CD. So um, in the release, the, the artifact releases, the binary releases that we are going to have, it, even those are to be uh, scanned at a given frequency and that frequency is, is not recommended from the uh, task force using uh, tools like these right so um, those artifacts could include the container images that was another straightforward item uh, i mean a non um, what do i say there was no uh, conflict of interest or there were nothing that people would be contradicting to if we bring in that process and yeah i will take a pass here probably and would like to hear feedback on the scorecard and the vulnerability disclosure element part so arun for those of us who have not been part of the security task force i don't think that uh, there's been opportunity or time to review kind of these extra links uh from open ssf um with the the vulnerability disclosures and the, the scorecard. Um, I I guess, you know, from the security task force perspective, the recommendation is on the this uh, vulnerability disclosures. The only real recommendation that I think I heard was the uh, CVE to be published by the end of 90 days. Is there anything else in that link that we would be uh, needing to to handle oh, okay um i would definitely recommend everyone to review the scorecard when it comes to uh, the above element which is this vulnerability disclosures it mostly talks about the reasons and um, um i believe it also has collection of um some of the incidents or like cvs that were reported from the past if i'm not wrong um yeah so um, this is something definitely to review in, in terms of what need to be reviewed. However, this is, is fine. Over here, the important aspect is in terms of learning from uh, the experience, learning from what 
others have faced in the past and trying to understand adopt the best model that works for us. So um, I would still probably recommend to have a glance through if, if possible. It's, it's more of a retrospective way of understanding what happened and then how do we make our processes better. Um, so in a, apart from this 90 uh, days thing, uh, the scorecard was another uh, um, proposal that came in from the recommendation, right? So um, I, I don't know, like, do you want me to go through each element or here, or do you want um, uh, TAC members to give some, I mean, give TAC members some time so that they can go through it and come back with and debate or probably debate on this topic uh, just from a standpoint that what are the problems that committers are facing right now or the maintainers are facing and why would it be a challenge that fixing something within 90 days is, is not possible or should we look into, for instance, the current release process because right now Hyperledger does not have anything to say when it comes to release um, life cycle uh, other than I, I think even that uh, Hart corrected me that that um, the release taxonomy thing is also not so tight right now right I mean it's it there is so much freedom from each project in terms of how they can um, uh, uh, proceed with the releases. So um, there are multiple ways in which we can address this particular concern. We can even tie this in with the release um, process it's, it's itself. We can say um, that any time a new project is releasing and if they are terming their release as, let's say, um, a major release or probably a, a release that they are going to support for a long time, then um, it becomes a responsibility from the Hyperledger Foundation because the release is happening under uh, under this umbrella of projects. So if anything gets reported, then it's responsibility or, or um, anything that comes back would be named against uh, the foundation um, and not just a project as well. So um, I, I don't know, a governing around that would also help or benefit. I did not put those thoughts because um, I did not hear an affirmative response from from those who are on the call related to those topics. Okay. Hart? Hey, Tracy. Yeah, thanks. So I think, so sort of addressing your point, I think our, you know, um, I think the, the plan today was to, to go over some of the recommendations and then hear what people think and then eventually package them in some kind of actionable uh, way that the you know, make an actual rule that the TSC could vote on. So I think that's the plan in the future. Um, but, you know, uh, th this is more of a, you know, these are the recommendations, what do people think? And then, you know, can we package these into rules will be coming, so. Okay, yeah, thanks, Fred. I, I And I think that's the way my concern, right? I, Obviously, I have not attended any of the security task force calls um, due to conflicts. And so for me coming in kind of fresh, and I'm sure there's other folks on the call coming in fresh to, to looking at this and not having clicked on any of these links, I, I'm like, okay, what do you want us to do, right? Um, and so I guess the, the thing that you're asking for right now is just commentary specifically on seven and eight. Um, not necessarily on the rest of them at this point, but uh, eventually on the rest of these recommendations. Is, is that kind of where we're at for today's discussion? Yeah, well, we'd love co uh, commentary on all of them, uh, but sort of, you know, we've thought that, uh, you know, seven is something that very much needs to be addressed and, you know, it's, it's easy to address. Uh, so, you know, our, our plan was to, to go over this and then, um, if if people are okay with it, you know, maybe in a couple a week or two, we'll we'll propose a um, propose a rule. Now, uh, some of these have have sort of already been the policy in theory, but there's never been any enforcement, and nothing has ever been done. Um, but yes, I, I hope that makes sense. Yeah. Um... So, I mean, for, for number seven, uh, like I said, I think the one actionable item that I see there is the, the 90 days, which personally, I don't have any sort of um, 
commentary for other than to say, I think whatever the best practices is, uh, that's what we should do. And I'm assuming that OSSF has the best practices. And so therefore uh, that 90 days is coming from them and, and is probably the, the right direction to head. Um, for the for the scorecard, um, I I guess the the question that I have is right now we do um, the only scorecard that I know that we're doing is um, I forget what it's called uh, because it's changed name. But is is this somehow different than the existing kind of self attested responses that we have for our projects to to see that they're in a certain state, is this only focused on security? Is how is this different, and is it how does this uh, one benefit the projects and two benefit the uh, Hyperledger Foundation? And Hart, I see you took your hand up. Arun, if you want to take over, please feel free to jump in. Right, I'm looking for my hand to be raised. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I will say um, that. Yeah, seven also no. involves a bunch uh, getting project contact points set up. Um, so we think it would be, you know, good to require that, you know, graduated projects have security contacts. And, and we plan on writing that down in a rule. Uh, as you know, as far as the the 90 days goes, uh, yes, that is very much the, the standard beyond the open SSF. Even um, and Arun, would you like to talk about the scorecard? Yes, I finally found my um, hand icon. <laughs> so, uh, Tracy, I guess you had a couple of questions in in your uh, previous ask. In terms of scorecard, um, I I'm not sure if you are asking about the CII badge uh, that we earlier had to our projects. Is that mm -hmm. the one that you have? That's asking? the one. Yep. Yeah. Right. I think it got renamed. Um, and this scorecard captures um elements in addition to that if i'm not wrong right um i need to go back to my notes sorry um i'll check the notes from one of the meetings um but sure i think another question that you were asking with respect to 90 days was and, and art also kind of brought up um, a separate committee. So now that we have representation from each project who's responsible to handle those issues, what we were thinking is in, in terms of long-term plan, um, have a committee set up, give focus more towards security aspects as well. And this needs to be um, a kind of cross collaboration that may not necessarily be within the project, but um, try to address some of them across projects and try to see um, how to handle them. So in order to support that or encourage it, there was also um, there were also discussions in terms of stopping a project from graduate graduation and um, unless they meet certain criteria. And then this criteria evaluation happens through a committee, which is again self-formed uh, with with this group uh, that we were talking about. And um, so Again, there were a few other open items. Will, will TSA be okay with it? And with the um, shift towards TOC or TAC, how would that be handled? Or what kind of responsibilities would this particular um, group of members would, would have? And what would they be uh, making decisions on? So these were some of the open items that uh, we could start debating in, in terms of how to handle it, right? <laughs> Okay, so back to the the scorecard. Um, so this is different than the open SSF uh, best practices badge that we have had projects going through, or is this uh, is this the same? Like, because the open SSF best practices badge has a security section in it, so I'm, I'm curious. Like, are we asking for more work from the projects? Is it, you know, um, how how much more work is it going to be for the project? It would be nice if one of the project can volunteer and evaluate it. Um, and I'm happy to work through 
walk through on that, right? So um, there's one more action item that I personally have taken through through the task force. That's to understand the current process. So I'm, I have set up some time in, independently to discuss uh, with the staff members itself to understand what do they go through and, and what's the process involved and why why did this question even came up that we are talking about uh, disclosing vulnerability at, at cutoff date of 90 days and why is it even taking that long for us if we know that it's a critical vulnerability so in terms of core card um i'm still searching for a meeting and i'm sorry i'll pass for a while i see i'm not talking i'm sorry hey i'm not yeah hi i mean i'm not talking yet but uh, i mean i i wanted to answer directly uh tracy's question i mean there is no current alignment between scorecard and the open SSF badge. And uh, so they are indeed, they, it, you know, doing both requires more effort than doing one or the other. Okay, thanks Arno. Yeah, and I, I was trying to quickly scroll through this scorecard. Um, it looks like the, there's some recommendations around some GitHub actions that projects can run uh, to kind of get their score uh, for this scorecard. Um, and I guess, you know, I, I'm thinking about in the past where we've done things, where we've tried to make things easier for the projects and the projects have pushed back as far as, you know, they don't want to do that or it's it's you know the the tools that we have is are very specific to a particular language or whatever the case may be right um and and so i'm i just want to see like how sure we are of this recommendation that the projects are actually going to um think that this is useful versus it's painful for them um, to do this i I'm in no way suggesting that security is a bad thing here, right? I, I'm just you know, trying to think about in the past what's happened within Hyperledger and the different projects where we've, you know, put down requirements for running particular tools. I agree. I think this, you bring a very good point there, and and I just wanted to explain a little bit of the background. I mean, Open SSF badges are basically renamed the CCI badges we've known for a long time. And uh, and the scorecard is a new tool that was developed initially by Google, and so there is they they don't share the same roots at all. And we can hope that OpenSSF eventually will try to get all these things neatly aligned. But it's clearly not the case that they have different origins and they are actually maintained by different groups within OpenSSF. So. Okay. Art. Yeah, so Tracy, you bring up a great point about uh, things being, you know, easy and low, uh, I guess, low work for projects. So what the, the, the plan going forward is, is we would like the, the TSC to sort of look over all of these recommendations. And as a starting point, we want to put together, you know, a list of some of the easiest and highest impact ones to implement, right? And then we will put those for approval for the TSC. Uh, this is, you know, obviously going to be an ongoing process. And some of the things are, are going to, you know, take quite a while to, uh, to put in practice. And something like the OSSF scorecard, which is, you know, not even, a, I, I would say, not even a complete effort at this point. Uh, might not be one of the first things we do, right? Um, we may want to let that mature a little bit before we ask projects to do it, for instance. And there are a number of other things on this list that uh, we probably aren't going to want to do immediately, but we would like to see long term. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, just trying to see how we can help move this discussion forward. Um, right for for something to come back you know to the tsc for for a vote um so it's trying to really understand and, and helping that this discussion is useful for others as well 
um, since I'm the only one who seems to be asking questions at this point. I think a lot of people probably have questions, but here, so thank you for asking them. Anybody else have any thoughts on this, Angelo? Uh, I, I like this, to be honest, uh, this, uh, the, this idea of the scores, maybe uh, in, in this sense, maybe there is also something that guidelines that we can find are specific for blockchain. Uh, that would be interesting. Can we ask uh, volunteers at the beginning? Maybe we don't force, but we have a, 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 a first period where we ask volunteers from uh, uh, the projects. I don't know, Fabric, uh, uh, maybe you can volunteer, but I don't want to put, it, uh, uh, I don't put myself in the shoes of Dave or no. But uh, to me, this sounds, sounds very interesting as, a, as an idea. And maybe it can be a good, a good point or reference, reference point for also for the, for the clients, for uh, the enterprise who are looking for, uh, I mean, for some handles. Uh, you know, I, I really like this. Thanks, Angela Hart. Sorry, I forgot to take my hand out. Oh, OK. I thought it came back up. Uh, maybe you took it down and then didn't think you did put it back up. That's no no worries. Any other comments? Um, Kamlesh? Yeah, yeah, this is so actually I like this because I, I think this is a need uh, to be in the Hyperledger Foundation project because even Arun and me in the Hyperledger India, we uh, kind of responded to a couple of inquiries where people are using the projects and Ask about the kind of vulnerabilities in the uh, hyperledger codes, and on that time, I think we don't have such, such a kind of framework or some kind of recommendation. If it's available, then we as a community can share, or maybe the people who are using the projects can get confidence. Like hyperledger projects are following the particular some standard and some some guidelines, and ensuring the security aspect of the projects. I think is good initiative. All right, thanks so much. Uh, so I have a, a follow-up question, which is, I think somewhere as you were scrolling, Arun, I noticed something about uh, projects moving from incubation to graduated. Um, and and so I'm, I'm curious as to security is not a one and done type thing, right? Uh, security changes as the code changes. Um, and, and so, what sort of expectation do we have for the scorecard remaining up to date? And uh, as the code changes, you know, the reevaluation happening to ensure that no security issues have been created slash added slash whatever, right? Um, to to the the source base. Hey, Tracy, that's a good question. Um... I don't think so. We discussed on that aspect, but um, we were still thinking if such a thing would be accepted by the TSC or not. If, if we think we need to go in that direction, then yes, definitely we will start thinking in the next upcoming call. It will bring this topic up again. And in terms of um, what we were thinking just for a regular cadence, I believe, I, I don't know. So there were, um, in terms of, it, it was tying back again to the, the um, standard processes that we were following and then how do we <clears throat> make sure that we are following those processes right so um so i had uh, two thoughts around it one is with respect to um, apart from the process itself in in terms of how well a project is going to handle and when something is reported how well are we responding back to those even those metric are to be captured um but yeah, we haven't had a chance to discuss, uh, go deep into this direction and, and thinking that we were not sure if something like this would be accepted. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I do think that, you know, the considerations as far as the cadence for when this gets reported, how often this gets looked at, right, is important. I. I just don't think that we can say that it's a static. We've done this when we moved to graduation, and so therefore we're we're done, and we're never going to look at security again. Um, that's that's the 
the piece that I would think through um, what makes sense again with the the caveat of how do we ensure that we're not uh, causing more work for the projects than they actually need to to be going through right is it every time they do a release they have to do this is it um, you know once a year they have to do this uh, you know I don't know what the right cadence is but I think there is a cadence and we have to understand how that impacts the the different projects Angela but for example I would definitely would like to have an update when there is a long-term release uh, a long-term support release mm -hmm. that definitely I would like to see that uh, an update uh, an update of the score there I don't like I don't need to see an update on the the day the day-to-day -day commit because that's uh, I, as a company I would I would not take that I would not use that the, the, those commits those temporary com commits so I don't expect to see the the score on uh, evaluated on main branch uh, that that's for sure I, I wouldn't expect that okay great thanks Angela all right. Hey, Tracy, even though we did not explicitly discuss going this far, assuming that we were not even sure if we were going to adopt a policy that would stop projects from graduating. So um, if we want to go down that direction, then one of the thought process, at least it came in, in this week's uh, rec and call were in terms of uh, the 90 days boundary that we were to put. What if projects don't follow even that in, in, in that given boundary? So there were uh, discussions where probably we should bring down that project from graduated to incubating or um yeah that was one of the way um, so we were discussing in terms of how can we um, make sure that projects understand that this is important at the same time we don't put in too much pressure and and going and taking the drastic measures okay that one got a lot of head raises. Uh, Bobby. <laughs> well, I know that we're working at the um, task force for the documentation and we're having running into the same issue. Like when is it um, required information from each one of the projects? When is it suggested information and what's the cadence for the update? So, I mean, maybe there needs to be some kind of system in place for the projects to, you know, maybe with the new release or yearly check in and say, yeah, all this stuff is updated. Okay, Troy. Yeah, I, I was just commenting on the uh, idea of um, <laughs> moving graduated projects to incubated. I, I think we should be careful throwing out those kind of ideas. That's uh, extremely drastic. Okay, Arno. Yeah, I guess I'm kind of in the same, uh, you know, thought uh, here. I mean, I, you know, before we get into discussing punitive, uh, you know, actions against projects, I think, you know, it would already go uh, some ways to come up with clear recommendations, instructions for the projects to follow. And then, you know, we can see how much uptake response we get. And if really there are projects that seem to be reluctant, we need to try to understand why. And only once, you know, we've gone through the whole process of ensuring, okay, this is really is something people must do. We should think about, you know, this kind of action. I think for now, I mean, we haven't had any policies. We haven't set any expectations, even though some might feel like, hey, this is, you know, part of this should have been taken care of by any you know, reasonable project. Uh, I think, again, uh, uh, for now, we should just lay the ground, so to speak, on what, what P projects should do. Okay, thanks, Arna. Angela? Yeah, uh, so uh, I, I, I will start by saying that I don't like part paternalistic approach, so I think we should not mandate anything specific, but this core, who is the target of this core? These are the, the possible clients of, of possible users of this enterprise, uh, uh, this enterprise. So they will they will be the one pushing for having this core. So if a project doesn't update the scoring or doesn't update this, uh, 
they will just lose tracking uh, because they will uh, client enterprise will prefer other blockchains that are pre or other tools that will uh, are are keeping up with the scoring thing and 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 so on so in case i guess our guidelines uh, i would expect guidelines and say hey, if you as a project you think that uh, for your clients for poten new potential clients this is a good thing follow these guidelines if you don't want to follow up to you i mean then you we are all on the market all right. And Hart? Um, yeah, so so a couple of comments. Um, Angelo, I think you're thinking like a security professional. Uh, and, and I wish more people analyzed situations like you. Uh, then again, if you look at how much money some say people dumped into the uh, IOTA cryptocurrency with their uh, hash function, if you recall, uh, I'm not sure everyone makes these educated decisions. Um, to Arno's point, uh, we don't want to, you know, sort of uh, immediately throw out, you know, everything under the sun. Um, we want to, you know, sort of slow roll these things out piece by piece, right? Uh, so, so any kind of binding rules or anything, we want to, you know, we, we plan on moving a little bit at a, at a time. Um, and as far as, you know, uh, active projects goes, you know, if a project is not responding to their security vulnerability reports, you know, should we really consider them an active project? You know, I, I mean, I think at some point we have to draw a line in the sand there. Troy? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I hear that. It's just, you know, at, at some point we have to also be worried about, um, um, yeah, maintainers uh time and interest and and not every project in hyperledger is a blockchain um for example aries is a set of umbrella projects and i'm not sure how you know these ideas about kicking things out of active would actually work for all the projects across hyperledger so um i i again urge caution on these kind of ideas of um uh, punitive measures um um uh, where, where maintainers may start losing interest in, in Hyperledger, right? All right. Thanks, Troy. All right. So I, I think it's um, the, the reason I did not mention this particular thing in the very beginning is to avoid uh, these kind of discussions. I understand um, all projects, they work, we work hard to get them into the stage where we, we are currently and then um, the the intention all intention over here is to understand what is blocking and from from addressing some of the critical vulnerabilities versus prioritizing them uh, as opposed to like for instance um we know the actual projects are being worked on and when, when we know if we understand that this particular issue would take us to redesign certain elements and that would take more than 90 days so yes that is understandable so um, there will be, of course, provision. So it's it's not. It was just a thought process. Like we, it won't be to that level for sure. Um, but there will be some recommendations which will come in a way which will allow um, um, a pathway where project teams can explain why certain thing is taking longer than expected, and um, allow them to discuss through their um, scenario, and if needed, see if we can get some help from some other place. So it's more to understand what's happening. And then um, I would probably also request uh, this quorum now that we are understanding the intensity of the of the issue of for any such suggestions that you may have what <clears throat> what might benefit each project, right? So um, I think it, it's good if we can also bring in those ideas. If you can uh, share those ideas that you might have, um, it will definitely help us. All right, thank you. Any other thoughts or comments? I think one thing that I heard in the, the discussion that we just had is that uh, people want guidelines not mandates which i think is very much on point with where we have been uh, in the past with our history for 
the technical steering committee. So uh, just maybe take that into consideration as you move forward with this part. So I will say that pretty much all of these rules have been stated as guidelines for quite some time. Like the 90 day thing has been in the security guidelines since I want to say 2017 or 2018. Um, and at some point, you know, uh, well, we have to ask if these guidelines are being effective. Yeah, hard. And the question there, I think, you know, 2017, we had, what was it, five projects or something like that, right? Um, we've thus increased since that point. Have we done a good job of communicating? what uh, what guidelines exist when we onboard new projects. I, I'm not sure that we've done a great job of that in the past. And so maybe that's a you know a question of how do we how do we do a better job of bringing along the history to new joiners, new contributors, new maintainers, new projects uh, as they come into the Hyperledger Foundation. Totally. you're you're absolutely right. And I also want to emphasize that we don't want to, you know, just sort of dump a bunch of mandates out on the community, right? Anything that we mandate would would be sort of uh, slow rolled, if that's the right word. You know, we would want to, you know, we don't want to take, we don't want to do this sort of all in one big massive chunk, right? We want to do a little by little by little. So something like our first mandate that we would want to see would be that every project would have two maintainers or two people on the security vulner the security list for hyperledger right so this is how you this is how you know if someone files a bug or posts something on hacker one this is how you get it right and, and this is sort of like a very minimum low bar you know and i would be surprised if anyone were against sort of this being a mandate right um, because it is such a low bar and it, it is something that, you know, projects would really have. So we don't want to, you know, start with massive mandates. We want to start with sort of, you know, small, easy things like that. Uh, and then we, we can gradually, you know, if things go well, introduce more stringent requirements. I hope this makes sense to everybody. Thanks, Hart. Uh, David? Yeah, and I just think of what this would have done to a project like Burrow, um, where, you know, they might have had a, a few maintainers, but some of the maintainers were a bit of a stretch because they were trying really hard to grow and recruit more contributors and, and were struggling to do so. And so, you know, I, I don't think it's a question of the reasonableness. I think it's a question of, you know, how do we make these guidelines to where they they help grow the project, meaning we, we, we help make and show clear value or we use them as a marketing tool or we, we do things to try to align these extra steps with things that help bring customers in or help bring contributors in and hopefully convert them to maintainers. And that, that's where some of these steps, um, they feel reasonable when we think, oh, well, everyone has plenty of time to do them. But when we're kind of in the middle of one of those projects that's, that's kind of trying to get that traction, it can be hard to meet all of these check boxes at once. So Nathan, Burrow was never an active project. So I don't think this would have ever applied to Burrow. Uh, and I don't think this is meant to apply to, you know, projects that are getting started. This is more of a, a steady state, you know, long-term, you know, your project is in production, so we need to have confidence in its security kind of thing. Um, does that answer the the comment? It helps. Um, it, it, it just it feels like we're 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 adding enough requirements that it, we we need to acknowledge that it, it creates more distance for those projects to cover to get where they're trying to go. Troy. Right. Yeah, I, 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 I'm, you know, I'm of course agreeing with Nathan there. Um, I, I am worried that we're not using enough perspective from the maintainers and uh, on these discussions, right? Um, I, I am, I am worried about the same points about 
uh, loss of interest, loss, loss momentum. It's, it's not just about this thing, right? It's just in general um, the shift from uh, kind of uh, the, the 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 coder's voice to not is is a is something we should be careful about um, in in trying to attract projects and, and people's time. Thanks, Might be worth uh, the task force reaching out to uh, the maintainer's mailing list or the maintainer's chat uh, channel to have some of these conversations to see if there's other sorts of input that might um, might provide a different perspective or idea. Arun? I um, just wanted to understand the last concern that Troy raised. Is it more to understand, I mean, is it to, is it that you're asking, how do we dis differentiate uh, any issue against a CVE or is it uh, on the other spectrum? Like once it is determined to be as a CVE, like how do we protect our maintainers from having to do something in a given time? No, it was just a general, it's just a general comment that I, <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm worried that, you know, we're kind of shifting from the, the guidelines and, and growing projects and using the coder's voice on, on for example, the TSC and, and shifting to um, less so. And I, I think the less that the coder's voice is, is, is here, um, the more trouble we will have growing projects and, and attracting interest. So just a general comment that I, I am a little concerned. Sure, thanks. All right, any other comments or feedback for the security task force and the recommendations they've been sharing with us? Any, Arun Hart, any questions that you have specifically for the TSC that we can answer um, that we haven't already talked about? So would um, TSC be open? Sorry, I see Peter raising hand. I'll go next. Hey, Peter. Uh, just one last quick comment on, I think the, theme is here uh, from people's comments is that some people say, oh yeah, we need better security, we need to improve. Some people say, okay, but we don't want that to cost us maintainers who would otherwise be willing to be maintainers or contributors, but then because of the security process, they would just uh, shy away from Hyperledger. So I see both points being well made. And then my thought on that is that uh, we should keep this in mind, as in, yes, the mandates should not be too harsh, but also, we should also keep in mind that there is a bar that has to be set. It's just a matter of where we set it and then wherever we set it should really be the level where we actually are confident saying, well, if you want it to be a maintainer, but you think this security bar is too high, then maybe it's better for everyone if if it's not happening actually. So that uh, then, then we all have to be sort of confident in believing this. And then that way, this question, this uh, conundrum can be resolved, in my opinion, in a way that everyone is satisfied with it. So it's, uh, it's a gradual thing. And uh, we can set the bar wherever we want to. So I think uh, we should focus on not whether mandates are needed at all or not, because I would say there has to be some. But then we can we can keep uh, working on where the bar should be with these mandates, because there is a version of events where the bar is set too high, and then we lose valuable people who would have been great maintainers, and they would have put in some effort in security, just maybe not 
the extreme that we set. But there's also a version of events where there's no bar at all. And then uh, some people end up being maintainers who really just did not care about security at all. And I would uh, try us to focus on staying somewhere in the middle, which is the optimal. Thank you. All right, thanks, Peter. Herp? Yeah, thanks for the comments, Peter. And I want to reassure everyone that in all of these meetings, you know, any mandates that we've talked about are extremely minimal. The bar has been extremely low. And it's been sort of things that you, you think about and you're like, you know, if, if something, if some project didn't do something, you'd be like, wow, that's really bad. That's embarrassing. You know, we're not, we're not we, we don't want to start with a high bar. We want to start with something very, very low and very easy. And we have talked to maintainers and we have taken into account, you know, how much extra work that, that these things would involve for maintainers. Um, and, you know, we do want to keep that as, as, as small as possible. Um, so, so we have, you know, Arun is, is, is leading this and doing a great job. Uh, and we, we have addressed, we, we have thought about these issues um, and we, we don't want to, to scare anyone away with a too high bar. So I, I hope that all makes sense. Thanks, Hart. Troy? Yeah, I mean, I, I think everybody, well, I shouldn't say everybody, but I think most will say security is important and, um, um, uh, you know, tra tracking these, these issues is important. And, you know, the downstream organizations that use these projects um, will, will probably agree with that um, <laughs> or, or should. Um, but, it, but in some other ways, it, it, it will also drive, um, you know, the utility and the usefulness of these projects by these organizations. And if, if they're not doing these things then the projects won't be used, right? So um, there, there is alternatives to the, the TSC um, trying to have unify, uniform um, high bars um, across all projects where um, it may make less sense in, in, in certain cases, right? So that's, that's kind of the problem with, I think, um, setting the, the, the unified bar for, for everybody when these projects aren't even all in the same category. So um, again, like security is important, tracking these things is important, especially in production. Organizations downstream from it will push from it um, um, besides, besides these kind of goals. Um, but, I, but I think, um, you know, keeping the maintainers on board is, 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 is quite important and getting momentum is quite important, right? So um, uh, it, it, it is tricky, but um, uniform rules, I don't know if that always works, right? So that's why guidelines is kind of a, an interesting way to be. And yeah, obviously things embarrassing should, should, be, uh, should be addressed. <laughs> Yeah, so Troy, that, those are all good points, um, and these have come up in our security task force meetings. Obviously, like you know, a blockchain explorer is going to need different security scrutiny um, than you know a blockchain itself, right, or, or a cryptographic library or something like that. Um, you know, we've thought about this, we have discussed this extensively. Um, so, so I think you know we. Uh, this is not something that we haven't considered, um, it, you know, even if it, I guess, didn't make it into the, the recommendations document. Um, but if you or anyone else, you know, is, is interested in this stuff and, and wants to talk about these issues, I, I'd highly uh, recommend coming to a task force meeting because I think a lot of the questions today we actually have addressed and have talked about in the task force meetings. Um, and they, you know, just, they haven't percolated up to this document. Yeah, I mean, that's fair. It was just, I, I think I got triggered and maybe others too on the, you know, <laughs> the, off, the offhand comment about downgrading projects where, where clearly yeah. that, that's, that turns from, um, you know, not, not a discussion about fixing embarrassing things, but to setting very high bars and being punitive, right? And that when, when, it's, when it starts sounding like that, I think people's hairs go up, right? Sure. And, but, you know, we're, we're just, we just want to ask for like, you know, very minimal things, right? You know, we don't want to pub, we don't want to publish anyone who's, 
you know, trying, right? Um, so, so I think, you know, we'll, we'll come up with something more concrete, I think, than these recommendations. Um, and, and I think people will see that this is not like, you know, be, being punitive is not the goal, right? Uh, we want to just, we want to incentivize people to do the right thing. Um, so when we, we, we don't want to punish people for trying. Um, so, so I, I hope this, I hope this makes sense. And I hope like, you know, if, if we can come back with sort of, you know, more concrete things that the TSC can actually vote on, that, that people will see that they're not, you know, excessively punitive. Um, and, and I don't think that a lot of these worries will, uh, will come to fruition. All right, Peter. Yes, I just wanted to agree with Hart and try to also say it a different way that I just thought of, which is that probably what we want to uh, avoid or protect against is this sort of legal term that I heard, which is uh, gross negligence when people cause some big trouble just by not giving at least a little bit of attention to something. So I think uh, if you if, if phrase it that way, then everyone can agree that we should try to prevent those cases. You know, if if there's a DLT project within Hyperledger, we should try to prevent issues where huge amounts of money, money would be lost in a production deployment because someone didn't take five minutes to double check something. So I think the scope, if if we think about it that way, then it becomes visible why at least a little bit of something is necessary. That's it. Thank you. All right. Well, with that, I think uh, we're just about at the top of the hour. I appreciate all the thoughts and the comments, and I'm sure the security task force does as well. Uh, Hart, Arun, thank you for bringing this to us, and we look forward to having some concrete guidelines being brought forward to the TSC in the future for us to have a uh, look at and comment and hopefully uh, work through the, the process of deciding whether or not uh, the guideline is something that we want to bring to the different hyperledger projects. So with that, I'm going to close today's meeting. Thank you all for uh, your time, and uh, we will talk again soon. Thanks a lot, Tracy.